Right. So thank you. And uh, welcome to the third week of uh, Halka Art Project and Arctic Initiative 2021 uh, spring season. Today we're listening to uh, Slobodan Dampai. Uh, most of us know him well, but for the record and for probably those who will be watching this recording later on on YouTube in Halka's channel. Uh, this is a very brief summary about him. Slobodan Dampai is a visual artist, curator, theater director, co-founder and artistic director of Archip Initiative, San Francisco. Since we are about to listen one of his lectures, a few words on his uh, academic career. Uh, he's a comparative culture and interdisciplinary curriculum designer. He has been delivering papers at international conferences based on his lectures, courses, and research since 1969, which address tangible and intangible heritage, comparative cultural studies, and migration of peoples, craft techniques, and ideas. Uh, in fact, his university level courses broadened the scope of art history into the history of art and ideas. His research includes geographies larger than the European culture sphere and developed in interdisciplinary across time curriculum that includes ancient and indigenous people as different cultures, ingenious and refined rather than primitive. Uh, Slobodan is currently a visiting professor in Anthropology Cultural Studies section at Timoshvara University, Romania. Uh, he was born in Yugoslavia after the Second World War. He lived in the UK and the US. And for the last 10 years, he has been living and working in Istanbul and San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Mr. Boda, we are ready for your lecture. I'm ready. Um, shall I share the screen? Yes, yes, please. Uh -huh. yeah. So, let me just get the, uh, like that. So, is this visible? For everybody? Perfect. Okay. Yes. Mm, thank you. Thank you. So, um, like um, Matters and Tolga's paper, um, it's um, really um, um, in, inspired and um, sent to the um, Ege University, again, University of Ege and Ege University in Izmir. Uh, for conference which was cancelled, but the, um, the book will be published. Euro-Asian Euro folklore fairy tales uh, bring, bridging the continents. And, um, but uh, this lecture is not exactly the paper because um, the paper, um, you know, discusses things, quotes things, and that could be tiresome in the in the le lecture context. So, and I have slightly enlarged it and slightly contracted at the same time. So, oh, it's not, um, not moving, but the sound is- moving. You have to click on the stream, you're in Zoom. If you click on the stream, then it will move. Ah, oh, okay. Great, thank you, Craig. You know, you have uh, experience. Um, and is the sound okay? You can hear me, everybody? Yes, the sound is good. The sound is perfect. Good, so then I'll start. Um, storytelling and um, theater, um, are sort of really closely related. And um, 
familiar and lots of um, crossover things come into them in, in a modern time. And also in the ancient time and particularly the Greek um, rituals became the theater. And um, so the timing is one of the most um, important elements of both storytelling and the theater. And so some of the crossover I would um, touch upon. But also what we are going to touch upon is less uh, understood parts of the theater, like the visual language, the subtext, the things which are sometimes relegated as inferior to uh, a voice and acting a literature. So um, this is just an example of a ritual object which is mysterious and people have different, um, it's a Trachan deity, but uh, just even if we don't know what it is, in itself, it communicates something, it gives us some energy, it gives us uh, both human and uh, imaginative transhuman relationship. And that is something which we would explore. Not knowing um, about those hands you just saw before, uh, and this would appear once again, this was the first um, uh, event we did at Halka here, uh, and it was um, called um, Narrative Moments, Whatever Happens in Time Could Be a Story. And um, on a piece of um, lid, we had this drawing and went to the seaside to photograph and suddenly a ship was there. So we waited until it came into the picture. And so the chance, the the intention, the human presence is something which we are interested. In. And um, often a neglected aspect yeah. of um, performance and story and particularly theater, theater, uh, the literature has uh, kind of invaded the theater in a sense of um, being the most dominant characteristic of it. But really, the sense of hearing, which is the, you know, the fundamental of the oral traditions, is an essential, essential presence in human story, in human unfolding. And um, the baby, and it's the first sense which developed, and it's the baby at the, um, in the third trimester of, uh, of the pregnancy absolutely hears everything. He recognizes mother's voice as a familiar and father's voice uh, if the father is uh, present a lot. And it has a spatial sense. So it knows how to turn upside down to exit. So um, this aspect of um, hearing being so early developed and something which recognizes the sound and begins to imitate them and the language develops very quickly. It's very important in this search for understanding the stories in the oral tradition. Now I'm going to go into the shared motifs. Some of them are intentional and like definite cultural in inferences and references. And some of them are similar notions which people came upon through their own um, neurological and existential effort. So um, there are a number of symbolic corridors in different cultures. This is at um, Hittites, Tesha, um, and um, it's a part from the Gate of Swing, so clearly the Egyptian 
presence and influence was there. Through the swing gate, you go through this tunnel and you arrive to the part of the old city, which was the sacred part. And they, through other gates, you arrive to the daily and practical part. And um, in um, Kume, the cave of the Sibyl has a similar kind of corridor. You go through this and at the end of the corridor is the Sibyl's room in which she used to give uh, the prophecies and the counseling as well. What is very interesting about this um, shape, it's not classical. It looks very much like the inside of the pyramids. The same kind of architecture carved in, in stone. And also um, there is a Hittite <clears throat> a small room, which is called the entrance uh, to the underworld. And same at Kume. First you met a Sibyl there, and then one um, a mile away, you went through um, similar kind of tunnels in the underground for a kind of a ritual meeting and supposedly meeting the ancestors. So um, this um, striking similarity at the end of the, of the room in um, Hittite room, there is this um, uh, solar deity and there are beautiful descriptions um, uh, on the wall carved into the stone about the entrance into the Andu. So um, another example of um, a motif which uh, persists and it repeats is the Egyptian Ankh. You see both figures on either side hold it in their hand. It's like a, in the shape of the cross, but it has this loop on the end. And also in the hieroglyphs on the top, you see it. And its immediate uh, translation and its vitality. It's a life force. So mm -hmm. it's the life force which is in the, the fresco manifestly given uh, to the pharaoh, to the person. And um, it was adopted by the Coptic Christians. And so the, their cross has um, tremendous resemblance to the Ankh. Mm -hmm. And um, this is another one. It has a very interesting numerological um, of all these elements, but um, I, I don't know how to unmute it. Hmm? Sorry? If you turn on your sound. Anyway, can you hear me? Somebody yes. said something. Um, I think someone's microphone is on. Ah, uh, okay. Um, so this is the, the um, Coptic church, which um, is clearly inspired by the Egyptian tombs. And it's a whole okay. edifice uh, um, built into the hill and only on the top you see this surface. But um, something which um, I want to discuss slightly more in the detail, it is the discovery uh, in the pots in 1945, left there for 2000 years, the Gnostic library of the uh, Nag Hammadi. And um, it is um, often what these people try to save and give it to us. It's also present in oral traditions. Just probably they were under tremendous pressure and persecution and did not train everybody to remember everything and so 
these manuscripts be saved. And um, they have um, um, gospels which are not included into the four major gospels, but they also had some pre-Christian elements and uh, particularly saved carefully, clearly torn out of other manuscript and put safely um, was this poem of uh, the first thought, the protonoia. And so I'm um, going to, I took each um, line separately, so we are kind of in it. And it itself, it's at the essence of oral traditions. And I, I'll deal with it later. I'm just going to read it. Uh, we read it together, of course. I am Protonoia, the thought that dwells in the light. It comes out of the computer, not the screen. I am the movement mm. that dwells in all. And whatever it is on the computer is on? Um, I, I hear some voices. Can, can you take your microphone down? I am the movement that dwells in all. She in whom the all takes its stand. The firstborn among those who came to be. She who exists before all. I move in every creature. I fertilize myself and breed and mate with those who love me. I am the fulfillment of all. Mary of there, the glory of the mother. I cast voice speech into the ears of those who know me. I am the voice speaking softly. I dwell within the silence that surrounds everyone. It is the hidden voice that dwells within me, within the incomprehensible thought, within the immeasurable silence. And many of the inner geometries of um, architecture and ornaments have that uh, link to primordial circles, the initial emerging of thought and ideas. This is the classic intersection of two circles which creates the equilateral triangle. And it's used from ancient Egypt throughout many sacred buildings. This is a charter in the main entrance. And um, something of the quality of this interaction of the two circles, and this diagram represents it, um, it's the mirroring, the echoing, the neurological part, which I would touch upon very soon. And many cultures in their own way, this is of course the Zen garden, enact this kind of waves of becoming. One thing which was, uh, which is overlooked, but is um, known the other name for the Ankh is a mirror. So the uh, Aristotelian, um, you know, the um, mimesis, like many other things, come from Egypt. And the Greeks do acknowledge themselves that everything they got came from Egypt. But uh, 19th century, um, you know, the 
colonial image of the West as superior has um, denigrated Egypt as uh, suspicious and um, uh, even Herodotus called them suspicious, um, but kind of um, superstitious culture, primitive in the 19th century way of emancipating the West. But um, um, mirror neurons are tremendously uh, important um, in understanding many, many things, but particularly culture, language development, and of course, the strengths and the power of the um, oral tradition. Uh, the paper, which um, I often quote by Mesut of uh, De De City, um tells us our ability to imitate others' actions holds the key to our understanding what it is for others to be like us and for us to be like them. The past two decades of research have significantly expanded our knowledge about imitation at the cognitive and neurological level. And this is one of my favorite pictures uh, a friend gave me. I don't know where she got it. While the parents are shopping, the two children are enacting something most primeval and Original. Um, and um, they tell us that um, um, the past two decades of research have significantly expanded our knowledge about imitation at the cognitive and neurological level. Through imitated others, human uh, young come to understand that others are not only, sorry, I'm, I'm reading, so, um, Young comes to understand that others are not only, only share behavioral states, but are like me in deeper ways as well. And here, you know, it's suddenly like a loop. Who is imitating whom? It's, um, and of course, the children very soon begin to imitate the adults or find an object to, to give it something they were given. And um, this propelled the human young on the developmental trajectory of developing an understanding on others' mind. So, it is so instinctual and so born, inborn to copy the grown-ups to become. But also the whole communication, uh, pre-computer games, uh, the whole human um, cultural existence uh, is based on mirror. And in traditional societies, the children are involved in important tribal rituals, given responsibility, explain, and allowed to imitate and have part of it. They have role models right in front of them. So um, there are some very simple, but never spoken or really understood uh, traits of the oral tradition. And um, Isaac Dennison, the, um, which is her writer's name, Karen Blixen, um, Danish um, upper class person, tired of the pettiness of the small um, 
provincial aristocracy uh, goes to Africa and lives there. And um, she writes the story and I would ex uh, go uh, to her own story, how she come to this um, at the end of this, but I want you to, I want to read you to, and I'm uh, sorry, if, um, you know, I'm not a great reader. I, I'm better at speaking, but it's important to, to read some moments. So she starts the story blank page and um, it can be found just by itself on the um, internet. And I don't want to go into it not to spoil it for you, but it starts with this very significant and could be even overlooked when you read the story. And first it starts like, by the ancient city gates sat an old coffee brown black whale woman who made her living by telling stories. So um, you think, okay, some kind of orientalist thing. But in few steps, um, we discover, and she makes a living by telling the stories, but in few steps, in the next paragraph of the story, she's instructing her um, grandchild to be the storyteller. And the child says, why my grandmother, said she, I went through a hard school. Be loyal to the story, the old hag would say to me. Be eternally and unswearingly loyal to the story. Why must I be that grandmother, I asked her. Am I to furnish you with reasons, Baggy? She said, and you mean to be the storyteller? Why? You are to become a storyteller and I shall give you my reasons here, there. When the storyteller is loyal, internally loyal and unsparingly loyal to the story, there in the end, a silence will speak. When the story has been betrayed, silence is but emptiness. But we, the faithful, when we have spoken our last word, we hear the voice of silence, whether a small snooty lass understand it or not. So uh, this is uh, often not even present in um, understanding of the stories. It's a performative and um, spectacular gestures. Now she continues, um, the, the, the storyteller. It was my mother's mother, the black whale, often embrace, who in the end wrinkled, wrinkled like a winter apple and crouching beneath the mercy of the veil took upon herself to teach me the art of storytelling. Her own mother, mother's mother, had taught it to her, and both were better storytellers than I am. But that by now is, is, is of no consequence, since the people, since to the people they and I have become one. And I am most highly honored because I have told stories for 200 years. So these um, two aspects of being faithful to the archetype of the story, each story holds some internal um, content, something which both neurologically, emotionally, socially can enrich us if we can absorb it, identify it. So the storyteller who might embroider the details but holds the archetype 
is doing its social bonding, teaching, healing, in a sense of recovered closeness role. And the sense of time, then they suddenly represent all the previous generations of the storytellers. They are within them. So uh, these are kind of Orientalist pictures, but I put them there um, because what is amazing about Karen Blixen, she in, immediately, first with this sentence is about storytelling, but she immediately dispels the Orientalism and tells most extraordinary story about Portugal. And I'm not going to tell you because I hope you find it uh, and read it, but it is about these nuns who create uh, um, uh, royal linens. So I'm going to show you the pictures of um, I made for another lecture where I, I analyze the story in details. Uh, but I want to tell you about how the Karen Blixen got this deep into the tradition. First, because um, she was um, um, humanist, deep humanist. She really was engaged in Africa. And um, the, the British used to call that type of uh, person nativist. <coughs> and she was looked down upon like, ah, oh, nativist. But she didn't mind. And um, she really helped um, the, the local, um, I'm just looking for the name not to mess it up, um, Kikuyu uh, people in Kenya. She was in Kenya and she was engaged with them. She helped medically and in any other way uh, from the colon colonial point of view, they were considered as squatters, but it was their line. And when she had to renounce her um, estate um, and return to, she fought for, for their rights. But for understanding uh, this um, way of writing about storytelling, comes from her having a major domo who was um, from um, Somali background, Farah Aden, and um, clearly she had worked with him. She was telling oral stories to her guests and friends and um, clearly, um, um, Judith uh, Terman in her book, Isaac Dennison, The Life of a Storyteller, describes and quotes how Karen Blix and Isaac Dennison articulates her working relationship with Farah Allen as creative unit. When she had to renounce her uh, farm in Africa, the only thing she could do was then to write some of those stories and they were published and um, you know they're remarkable um, in their depths and psychological understanding and um, what they bring to people. The Somali uh, people have um, an um, arrival of, um, from Persia in the 13th century by Sheikh um, Ikbik. Uh, uh, I put it on my wall, but it's too far now to read. Uh, yeah. Ishkwad uh, bin Ahmed. And he was um, Qadiri Sufi. So um, that um, tradition, like many other traditions, have the storytelling as one of the central 
ways of transmitting the knowledge. So only someone who has been connected in some way to such an oral tradition will be able to write that those two introductory paragraphs which I read you earlier. So uh, the conference in uh, Izmir is about um, Euro-Asian stories and bridging. And this is most extraordinary combination of Danish woman in Africa meets the Kwadiri tradition of Persia and is herself a talented, extraordinary storyteller. So this is just the linen and if you find the story this would not disturb the extraordinary way and it's very short it's like two pages but it's the whole universe and so i'll approach the subtext so in my paper, which will be eventually available, I really give an example of this story spinning, which uh, <clears throat> we first uh, one person use it uh, personally, and then in our Alexandria uh, performance, we actually included it there. But I'm not going to go into it. I want to give you more direct sense of it, if I can help it. So I first start with um, uh, Sarah Bernard, who is um, celebrated uh, um, you know, 19th century actress of a Western type of theater, which is very declamatory and big gesture and a huge performance. And, you know, she was a master of that um, genre. And um, she played, um, you know, the significant roles and, you know, had always um, extraordinary looks and costumes and um, a presence. She was a public figure as well. And then there was Leonora Duse, completely different. They were contemporaries. And both of them played uh, a lady of camellias. And um, when um, Sarah Bernard played it, the audience would, and at the end, the character dies and is dying in the arms of the lover who she had to renounce because of the class um, problems. And he only realized later, so she's dying. So when the Sarah Bernard does this, the audience is shouting, bravo, bravo, and clapping. When this actress, Leonora Duse does, the audience is crying. So, and this is what she says. If the sight of the blue skies fills you with joy, if a blade of grass springs up in the fields has power to move you, if the simple things of nature have a message that you understand, rejoice for your soul is alive. And this could be said about the traveling singers, the wisdom holders uh, in, um, you know, the, the people described by Tolga in Mongolia and Siberia last, that connection with nature is the primary um, subtext, which then generates neurologically some reflection. 
and um, I have here a few theatrical explanations of the subtext, but they would um, hint at what significance that has for storytelling, for painting, for singing. Sub subtext is theatrical method that can reveal deeper motivation and needs by focusing on unspoken thoughts. Uh, another um, from Sonia Moore, professional training for an actor, her, she says, the term has several interlocking meanings in the theater. But we can think of subtext as an unspoken thought of the character, which might be implied by her actions. I'm just showing you uh, Eleonora Duse. Put another way, subtext is what we mean but do not say. Another quote, which is very interesting, says, the forgotten thing is about the nuance of sound that only employ words as a ballast for the flight of pitch and intonation. It is the pitch and intonation that carries the meaning. And so the internal world, the understanding of human condition, the empathy, and the personal suffering. It's all part of being able to communicate and give catharsis to someone else. I did not use paint. I made myself up morally. And the anguish, the loneliness, the misunderstanding when the artists or the thinkers or people or healers or doctors, when any of us can bear the unbelievable anguish and be able to share the beauty that is the secret of subtext. So my paper goes into a deep um, analysis of um, um, this um, article, but here I'm just going to go more um, general. So um, uh, this um, fresco is Etruscan. It's prehistoric. It's found in Puglia. It's now in the museum um, um, in Naples. And it is the wailing dance where women dress in a particular way and have this uh, um, kind of chain going and singing. And um, it's still performed today, um, these days not in this costume, but almost until late 50s, the woman had this wailing costume and would do it. So this um, opens up of um, um, this holding of the human story, but also being able to create a condition. So this is, um, of course, um, um, in the uh, Tolga's area of the Siberian, Mongolian woman, shaman, waiting for the return of the birds, celebrating the birds and the vitality of birds. 
and sharing with her community. Um, in um, Sultanova's paper, this is a photograph from there, uh, she talks about um, a woman wisdom called the strained um, Otin Oyus. I might have mispronounced it, but um, and they are respected part of the communities. They celebrate uh, the Umai and the, 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 the feminine um, uh, aspect of uh, sky and uh, but they have a uh, multiple training they are in daily life the only way you can recognize them at ceremonies they wear a white scarf and you see the woman behind the singer quietly standing there not um, attracting any attention just holding the energy of her community and she would talk and she would um, tell stories but at that moment she's in the background and this um, simple drum has been this is the uh, Dionysian women's part of Dionysian mysteries the women went alone into the forest and uh, perform and help each other which is at the base of the Tarantella dance. Um, and not just dance, the whole healing process. This is something um, we have studied for 15 years and then um, created it as a play in which a fully trained Tarantella young woman comes through the conditioning of post to first world to to America and they think she is dumb but the play reveals her depths but what is um, overlooked and um, Often now, the pop singers try to do Tarantella and they fall into the trance on stage, but nobody falls into a trance. The very almost identical practice is done in Egypt under the name of Tsar, and there are many in um, uh, many, many other places. This is the, the, the leader, the, the same as in the, uh, Central Asian example I just showed. She plays the rhythm and sings the song. Some of those women knew thousand songs. Some of them they sang in languages they know, didn't know what it is, but they knew what it can do for a person. But they never go into trance. They watch carefully. They, through their internal neurological attention, bring the person to a transpersonal space in which they can um, absorb the grief and the abuse of whatever they are experiencing and the woman of wisdom holding brings her back. This is a Pompeian fresco showing the similar situation in which woman who needed help is now recovering and the wisdom holder is watching over her. And here is back to the far, far across the age. Same internal quality, training. So uh, Meta showed us uh, this storyteller from Bosnia who was one of the last ones singing. And um, um, what happened in Bosnia, people like him could uh, tell um, Islamic, Christian, and also different Christian, Catholic, and um, 
Jewish stories. So they were not uh, sectarian. Their um, openness. Now, uh, most people, when I was a child and um, one of um, our mentors was, um, um, you know, amazing musicologist, um, um, Milica Ilin, um, and nobody, maybe now people do, but nobody could explain why a Balkan goosele and Serbian goosele have a horse's head. I said, well, you know, horse's head. But instruments in Siberia and Mongolia all have a horse's head. The connection between Euphrates and Danube is evidence in prehistoric time. Kukutani um, amazing figurines have their relatives in Central Asia and so on and so forth. So that flow of the um, archaic culture um, was evident. Lots of people think that some things are because of um, Ottoman and Ottoman also has respected all the religions, so, um, but it is prior to Ottoman. Again, we have kind of westernized it and put it into the um, tonalities which are fixed and west. In our storytelling, we encourage um, the person to tell in their way. But we offer some elements of stylization. So um, it's a little bit like what Tolga showed us, then the shamans wear all those extraordinary costumes to tell people this is a different moment. Well, we, do, we don't want to dress and be theatrical as uh, um, Sarah Bernard, she was the master of that type, but just simply. So here is Meta telling a story about his ancestors, basically his grandmother, but also relating it to the previous woman and in front of the painting, which is called The Women of the World. And then Nazila gave us this wonderful fabric and now we all share this shirt. I wear it and Meta wear it to tell the story occasionally. So these tiny details make it um, both stylized but approachable. These are not some out of the world. Um, these are people we know, people. This is Jansu telling a story of her grandmother wearing her grandmother's coat and hat. So um, I'm going to show you um, some elements of what we do in the storytelling. And I usually don't do that because I don't want people to think that there are some rules because some things come up. But there was this um, workshop in Portugal and, um, and we have done it also in Germany. So I also use this image from our first thing at Hauk. Narrative moments, anything which happens in time could be a story. So um, I'm going to, to read you this and also just um, as a poetic invocation, then I have put some slides to kind of match them, but they're not illustrating them literally because you know that will be impossible and also too literal. So lyricism and the scale of the storytelling from open process to thematic kernel. We start with improvising, but we solidify, and in the end, it's a rep repeatable matrix. Then chance favors the prepared. 
improvisation is sometimes overrated. And then after a while, people improvise in the same way. And then embodying ideas, visible and invisible. So just he tells the stories, story, and they're with him. some object which embodies the story. Space and visual bounds is tangible and implied architecture of a performance space. Because sometimes we take it for granted, okay, it's a stage, but there is also aspect of space and how it's used, energizing the space for the sharing of stories. And this is very much um, a misunderstood and not practiced. But in um, cultures which um, uh, Tolga described as energizing of the space, um, um, where it happens or the moment is the secret of, of that uh, presence of the wisdom halls. Group dialogue and nonverbal aid. So uh, for one performance uh, in the park, we created these egg shapes and um, they were everywhere, but one of them was containing a moment. It became an architectural fo focus, somewhere in the trees and, and when we prepared for the, um, Alexandria performance, we used the sticks. Later we used them also in the play, but it was more just to get a sense of the around the space, invisible space, to touch the space. So we drew with, with these canes all kinds of forms. We um, responded to each other with them. They were not aggressive, they were floating. We usually don't use this um, big gesture to the sky, but in this moment where people were waving in and out, feeling something natural, but also creating personal and the space of together, the invisible architecture and the visible architecture of the space was present. And then, the ensemble, complicated or ever-changing um, body of being together. And this was ensemble for the Tarantella's show, but plus the musicians. And we made it from scratch. So storyteller's body and voice, public and private, storyteller's secret, I and not I paradox of sharing, costume as talisman, personification process, individual character. So, a narrator, this particular piece was about uh, African-American history. And this uh, performer uh, told it beautifully because he was deeply connected with the, with the subject. And uh, Ty Blair. And so the sharing the body, the object. This was a piece which um, Ali and Zia um, unfold this uh, net in many ways. So it was 
bonding, it was separating, it was idealizing, it was um, confusing. But, and this is the moment where it becomes a harp. So the articulation of the space and the body are in harmony. Most, most people take costumes for granted and uh, <clears throat> don't take them seriously. And that's how it is, because it's inferior to words and, you know, it's just something you wear. <coughs> but when it's understood, and sometimes it's understood without some awe, suddenly people begin to use it in a beautiful way. So one realizes they understood it. And, but when the costume is a talisman, when it is the signal, the nonverbal signal, of the character of the atmosphere, even of the puzzle, then something very, very significant happens. And there is Swell in one of um, our musicians at the time for quite a, quite a while and she always watches and in many performances there was a dark and she and other musicians just two others would play by relating to the movement on the stage and the people on the stage would relate to the motifs which we chose for that particular scene so we call the, uh, our musicians the acrobats of the heart. Timing, composition and time, modalities of organizing time, sequences, messenger, timeless and contemporary techniques. It's a, it's a complex um, set of ideas to, to approach so I would just simply touch upon it and mostly visually. So here is a, a shaman drum and a user. The already the pictorial image and then the time it takes to either tell a story, sing, a, song or drum on it for a particular purpose creates its own entity and of course this is uh, from our ship um, sequence The performance was, a, the ship was a, um, a military ship in the Second World War. So our performance was called Ship Remembers and it was about sailors' memory of their sweethearts, wives, the conspicuous absence of women in a ship like that. And so we have all kinds of scenarios um, for it. This was on the outside kind of a separate part of that same thing. And then we actually had performance indoors, which we did. So, this uh, woman came to us, she had a polio as a baby, and she was a born dancer. And she said, I want to work with you. So we created all kinds of things for her. So this is when she stood up for the first time in her life. And then um, Augusto is Filipino and she is uh, Chinese. He played a um, um, Japanese lullaby and we called the piece Zen Waltz. 
and it looked like she was uh, moving him, but he was moving her. So, in the tarantella, we broke all the theatre rules and have only one voice, one narrator, the grandson of the main character who told all the story, a hard job, but Craig did it beautifully. So the last one, the audience, and I have already touched it before. This is where the deep communication happens. This is where the audience cries. This is when they understand something. So, in conclusion, I have shown these images before, but I'm showing them because we can see the children absolutely watching and being taught and sharing, present, not jumping around, concentrating. And um, a multi-generational group, this, for this ceremony, they are performing. The next time they will maybe perform. But the most important is this figure, the wisdom hub, the one who is holding the place. He might or might not be singing or reciting. He might be silent or partially singing and with the people performing and so on and so forth. But the unity of wisdom holder and community, which sometimes perform and sometimes don't perform, create an extraordinary bonding cultural nexus born from the performance, from performative action. Here again in India, you can see the young people are very involved in this ceremonial performance. And the native chanting and presence under all kinds of con conditions, keeping their tradition in nonverbal, verbal way. And this is Caribbean with tremendous memory of Africa. Some of the rituals are almost identical to the Western African ones, but the little boy is present. It's held and it's concentrated and watching. So it takes 10 years for three hours a day to be a master of anything. Once an instrument is mastered, the, the voice is mastered, the cooking is mastered. Some essential continuity vitality is communicated. This is one of the last Turkish ashik. Is blind and strong. But we have replaced it with progress. We don't nurture our internal responses in it anymore. We give babies telephones. This kind of unity is being eradicated. They call it social distance. They could have called it mutual care space. It will be a completely different response to the crisis we have. But the sound and the listening 
and the unity is very bright. It's nothing like being bombarded, violated, and addicted to the fast beaten noise, which destroys ears most precious part, not only hearing, but also the balance. The balance is physically important, but it also gives a sense of security and internal balance. This is a, a, someone gave me the picture. Their friend's child was taken to the pop concert and the child's um, immediate nat natural reaction was to close the ears because of the level of the sound. So we hope and we are working on visceral, virtual um, balancing. We are creating in different spheres programming very tentatively and small in which some meaningful integration of the bodily experience can be included. So people could sing together, even if they're out of the tune. This, this woman or not. But, and look at the unity of these um, musicians from Albania. They're listening to each other. So be faithful to the story, the grandmother said. There was a girl of today dreaming in the 25th chapter of her dream, frightened in a cage, looking at this place outside, when suddenly in the 24th chapter of the dream, she was out of the cage, looking at this place, which looked familiar but still she was cautious. And in the 23rd chapter of her dream, she turned into a peacock, was surprised, and saw the angels, the cupids, playing, and they look half alive, half carved in stone. And in the 22nd chapter of her dream, she felt the breeze, the breeze in that place, which moved even the carpet hanging over the balcony. And in the 21st chapter of her dream, she realized the year was 1486. Oh, she begins to remember in the 20th chapter of her dream, the carvings and the details of the place in the ninth chapter of her dream. And in the eighth, she felt she was everything. The corner of the doorway, the emblem, the apple and its shadow in the 18th chapter of the dream. And in the 17th, she saw herself as a little girl looking at the serious conversation of adults. And in the 16th chapter of the dream, she saw herself in the cage and out of the cage, with carpet of the balcony and the daily life of that place. And in the 15th chapter of her dream, she saw him, escorted by the governors. He was unaware of her. And in the 14th chapter of her dream, she remembered her father 
serious, but lovable to her. And in the 13th chapter of the dream, she was flying above the city, free, looking down on it, when suddenly, in the 12th chapter of the dream, out of her heart and out of the sky, huge spark blew out into the space. And in the 11th chapter of her dream, she saw her little city offered to that spark. And in the 10th chapter of the dream, she saw him more splendid than ever escorted by a friend who was wearing a bishop's clothes, but much too young for a bishop. And in the ninth chapter, a dream, she looked at his garment and the details, the tassels and the embroideries. And in the eighth chapter of the dream, she realized he got wings, her own wings with which she was flying above the city. And in the seventh, at the same time, chapter, she remembered the embroidery she made. Then, at that time, and all the little things she was using in the sixth chapter of the dream. And in the fifth, she remembered her favorite dress she was wearing. And in the force, kneeling in front of her window, and outside, there she was, concentrating not to be gazing too much when really suddenly their eyes met in the second chapter of the dream. They look straight into each other's eyes and from that look the unbearable sense grew into her heart and she woke up the girl of today dreaming and she saw on the wall a reproduction she bought in the museum the day before but the experience remained and we are told that in dreams like in dying there is neither space nor time through our conditioning in time the dreams happen backwards from the essence of the dream to its details but like in there is neither time nor space but only the soul Thank you, Sir Gordon. Thank you, everybody. It's very beautiful. And maybe now we can unmute ourselves and uh, yeah. join the conversation. Um, am I talking? Hello? Hello, hello. Um, it's beautiful, Slobodan. Thank you. Uh, uh, it was fun to see. Forgive my bird. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was my 
my very talkative bird. Of course, when I start talking. Um, a couple of things. Thank you very much. I really loved the story at the end in particular. But throughout your your essay lecture, whatever it it um, the way you interweave things is very uh, consoling, and your manner, in fact, tells the story in a way better than your words do. It's just wonderful how you blend these things and then inter interweaving, you know, the artship performances. I love. But as an aside, and it has something to do with storytelling, certainly. Likely, you know, of the friend of uh, Isaac Dinesen in Kenya named uh, Kamanti Gaturo. He was sort of like the major domo of her property. Mm -hmm. And he, there was a book published called Longing for Darkness, in which he recounts, from his point of view, her stories mm -hmm. from uh, Tales of Africa, or Out of Africa, or whatever it's called. And it's, it's so interesting. It's not exactly Rashomon, but it's, it's just, it's the beauty of the different ways stories can be told. Yeah, but I, uh, I, I anyway, never heard of it, yeah. it's called Longing for Darkness. It's beautiful. Great. And, and he's not a professional artist. He's a fabulous amateur and it's illustrated with his animals and things like that. <laughs> thank you, Sabodin. It was wonderful. Oh, thank you for your comments. Yeah, of course. Well, I think everybody's thinking, still thinking that you have given us. Oh, it's, it's good. <laughs> the silence should speak at the end of the story, so mm -hmm. no problem. Mm. But, um, we keep going and um, next week we have a performance. Wonderful. <laughs> so you would see, see it in action. Mm. Ma, thank and, you. And thank you for coming. Oh, well, such a you. pleasure. You draw people into such a strata that's um, so unusual and so profound. It's wonderful to experience. Again. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Slowly but surely. Mm. Mm. And then the book about Fano will probably come up in um, in May. Yes, and she's about to have a baby, isn't she? Yes. Ooh, exciting. Very mm. remarkable. Yes. Both, both of them. Mm. They're beautiful. Mm. So. So. Love. See you next week. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you all for being with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Okay, see you. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Sloboda. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Lovely to see you all. <laughs>